Excerpt from Remembrance of Things Past by Marcel Proust, a legendary book by a legendary author. I feel that there is much to be said for the Celtic belief that the souls of those whom we have lost are held captive, are held captive in some inferior being, in an animal, in a plant, in some inanimate object and so effectively lost to us until the day which to many never comes. When we happen to pass by the tree or to obtain possession of the object which forms their prison, when they start and tremble, they call us by our name, and as soon as we have recognized their voice, the spell is broken. We have delivered them. They have overcome death and returned to share our life. And so it is with our own past. It is a labor in vain to attempt to recapture it. All the efforts of our intellect must prove futile. The past is hidden somewhere outside the realm, <clears throat> beyond the reach of intellect, in some material object, in the sensation which that material object will give us which we do not suspect. And as for that object, it depends on chance whether we come upon it or not before we ourselves must die. Many years had elap elapsed during which nothing of Combray save what was comprised in the theater and the drama of my going to bed there had any existence for me. When one day in winter, as I came home, my mother, seeing that I was cold, offered me some tea, a thing I did not ordinarily take. I declined at first and then, for no particular reason, changed my mind. She sent out for one of those short, plump little cakes called Petites madeleines, which look as though they had been molded in the fluted scallop of a pilgrim's soul, pilgrim's shell, and soon mechanically weary after a dull day with the prospect of a depressing morrow. I raised to my lips a spoonful of the tea in which I had soaked a morsel of the cake. No sooner had the warm liquid and the crumbs with it touched my palate, a shudder ran through my whole body and I stopped, intent upon the extraordinary changes that were taking place. How extraordinary! An exquisite pleasure had, been, had invaded my senses, but individual detached with no suggestions of, it, of its origin. And at once the vicissitudes of life had become indifferent to me, its disasters innocuous, its brevity illusory, this new sensation having had on me, the effect which love has of filling me with a precious essence. Or rather this essence was not in me, it was myself. I had ceased now to feel mediocre, accidental, mortal. Whence could it have come to me, this all-powerful joy? I was conscious that it was connected with the taste of tea and cake, but that it infinitely transcended those savours could not indeed be of the same nature as theirs. Whence did it come? What did it signify? <clears throat> How could I seize upon and define it? It's so overwhelming. I'm sorry for the hoarse exclamation. I drink a second mouthful in which I find nothing more than in the first. A third which gives me rather less than the second. It is time to stop. The potion is losing its magic. It is plain that the object of my quest, the truth, lies not in the cup, but in myself. 
I drink a second mouthful in which I find nothing more than in the first, a third which gives me rather less than the second. It is time to stop. The potion is losing its magic. It is plain that the object of my quest, the truth, lies not in the cup but in myself. The tea has called up in me but does not itself understand and can only repeat indefinitely with a gradual loss of strength the same testimony which I too cannot interpret, though I hope at least to be able to call upon the tea for it again and to find it there presently intact and at my disposal for my final enlightenment. I put down my cup and examine my own mind. It is for it to discover the truth, but how? What an abyss of uncertainty whenever the mind feels that some part of it has strayed beyond its own borders. When in the seeker is at once the dark region through which it must go seeking where all its equipments will avail it nothing, seek more than that, create. It is face to face with something which does not so far exist, to which alone can give reality, to which it alone can give reality and substance, which it alone can bring into the light of day. And I begin again to ask myself what it could have been, this unremembered state, which brought with it no logical proof of its existence, but only the sense that it was a happy, that it was a real state in whose presence other states of consciousness melted and vanished. I decide to attempt to make it reappear. I retrace my thoughts to the moment at which I drank the first spoonful of tea. I find again the same state illumined by no fresh light. I compel my mind to make one further effort. I mean, <laughs> is drinking it like tequila? Sorry, that's a wrong statement. I am a tea lover in that first sip, especially in the morning. I know the second sip is not like it, but, but I don't stop. I just hungry. Oh my God, I just gulp it down because to me, tea does the same to the last sip as it does to the first. But, you know, I wrote a history paper called Why the English Took to Tea. And now I think when I revise it, I have to write that, yes, it is Bruce who described the effects of tea the best. Thank you so much for listening, my dear friends. And we will continue these random readings like this.